Okay, happy Monday, everybody. <laughs> happy like Monday. Old... I had to uh, start the player, record, do all the wonderful stuff that before we could start. So um, let me bring our guest on today. I think so. Uh... See, I, I sent you an invite if you can grab it. Um, hi, Brand. Good morning, Brand. Good morning, Legion. Good morning, Damini. Yes, we are on for the 19th, so no worries. But um, welcome, ladies. Oh, my God. I feel like I've, I've talked to you guys for like a couple of weeks. It feels like forever. How are you? It really good. does feel like forever. Yes, I'm good. I'm good. I actually got a chance to listen in a little last week, but I couldn't be on. And so I'm excited to be here today. Well, I'm excited for it, too. And also, we got the meet and then, uh, we have to plan because uh, National wants to know our calendar. And we are I told him we are meeting in person again. So we're going to start setting up the calendar for that. But um, you know, Roberto and Christine, who used to run the Blue at Boca Resort, opened up their own restaurant, and they want us to come out and take a look at it. And they want to work out the same deal with us. <laughs> well, that is oh, exciting. Cool. The Blue is always the best, so. That's awesome. I think it's just the book resort is always best. <laughs> okay, true. That also. <laughs> yeah. The book resort always does it does it better for me. So, um, yeah. so be, before we start, let's have Terry do our uh, morning uh, empowerment meditation to get us going, and then we'll bring on our special guest. Good morning, everyone. Let's just relax. Drop your shoulders, relax all the muscles in your face. Eyes are closed, jaw relaxed. Take a deep breath in through your nose and exhale through your mouth. Again, inhale, exhale. One more time, inhale. And exhale. Feel the stress go down your arms and out through your fingertips. Relax your chest and your torso. Relax your hips. Feel the stress go down your legs, out through your toes. You're completely relaxed. With each breath in and each breath out, you're feeling more and more relaxed. Another deep breath in. And out through your mouth. And begin this week with a new outlook from last week. You're different. You're a different person than you were last week. And let it all be as positive as you can possibly make it. And I'm going to close with this quote. You should never regret anything in life. If it's good, it's wonderful. If it's bad, it's experience. Another deep breath in. Exhale out. Namaste. May the divine in me honor the divine in you. Love you all. Thank you, Terry. I feel like I went on vacation for a second there. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Ah, so now we're all nice and relaxed and we're ready to get empowered on, on on Monday. And the reason we came up with this is to feature a communicator of the week of what they've done, what they accomplished, or what they're going to do. Um, so I had ran across uh, Sia, uh, and you know, you have to realize I'm very into NFTs because I feel like it's the next thing, you know, especially Web3, because Web2 is, you know, it's all about social media. Now, Web3 
three where everyone's talking about it, but no one know much about it. And I feel like we're always ahead of the trend when it comes to women in communication, the South Florida chapter. Um, we were like the first one to have Twitter. And, you know, that, that that's a big um, mark for us, um, right, Emily? Because Emily's been on Twitter, too. <laughs> it's a huge thing for all of us who are uh, Twitter users. It really is. It was such a big thing for all of us. And um, people kept saying, you know, in the last few years, like, oh, Twitter's dead and nobody's on Twitter anymore. I'm like, no, stay around. It, it's going to come back around. And now here we are again. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I am a big believer in Twitter. And now with social audio, I think that's really um, bring Twitter a bit further. And then now we talk about the blockchain, the NFT. The there's so many things that what was Web two that's going into Web three. But I feel ah. like it's better. So um, today we have our special guest. Her name is Sia Sense. Did I pronounce it right? <laughs> I'm always asking yes. for that. How are you? Good I'm morning. Good. good morning, Tanya. How are you? Fantastic. So um, I'm here today with Emily Tavel, who is my communication director. Terry Michael is my VP. And we usually, um, we, we, you know, before the shutdown, we always do an, an Empower Yourself workshop where we feature um, eight women at a luncheon. But since we couldn't do that, we decided to go ahead and start a, a podcast um, content for um, just to raise awareness about all the different women all over the world. Um, we try to focus on South Florida, but then on the, along the way, you know, because of what's happening in the world, it seems like there's border when it comes to um, digital media. So um, today I wanted to go ahead and, and um, chat a little a bit to our feature communicator of the week and also find out more about her. Um, so let me, uh, this is, let me read off a little short bio for her. So. CSNS is a recovering corporate ladder climbing addict in real life and a storyteller in Web3. Her goal is to onboard and train women and youth into the Web3 space to create a space where all can succeed by raising each other. Sia is a single mom of two amazing daughters, inspiring her to be the best version of herself. She wants to tip the scales of how resources are distributed in this, in this world. Now is the time to do that and accomplish it. So everybody, welcome Sia Sin. She's in the space. Hi, Sia. How are you? I'm good, Tanya. I'm good. Hi, Emily. Hi, Terry. Hello, Sia. How are you? It's nice to be able to have a chance to talk to you. I'm excited to chat today. Hi, likewise, Sia. Likewise. Hi, Terry. I'm sorry. I got like a little bit of a throat problem. I, uh, my seven-year-old caught like a flu bug in school and she's, you know, you know how they just transfer it to you. It's like we get everything from them. <laughs> We do. I actually just had another call that rescheduled for today for the same exact thing. There's like some thing going around. She's got a six-year-old and definitely some bug going around with all the kiddos. Yeah, it is. And I think that because we were like so, um, how should I say, uh, secluded or isolated for two years, I think that when those kids started going back to school, they started bringing everything else back. So, hundred percent. We had that happen too. But yes, it's... We, Drink some honey and we'll talk for an hour and then we'll let you go. But we're excited to be able to chat with you today. I know the, the throat thing is always the worst, but um, thank you for being here. I'm actually honored. Thank you. I mean, I, I'm so uh, glad Tanya and I just connected and we just clicked and we started talking about stuff. And she's like, hey, we're doing this thing and it's an amazing, you know, platform. Um, I'd love for you to come and talk about what you do, what you're doing right now currently in the space. It sounds like, yes, I'm totally excited to do that. Absolutely. So why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? I, I read the short bio that you had sent me, but tell us a little bit about yourself and when did you like got into NFT and and, and why are you like submerged into this? <laughs> well, um, so I'm a business analyst in real life. So I basically, um, I, I develop IT applications. I, I strategize. So uh you know, I, um, well, th a little bit about my past is that, you know, I, I got out of a really nasty uh, relationship, uh, a marriage, actually, of 20 years. Um, it wasn't going anywhere. And I think that, you know, it did um, kind of put me in a place that 20 years where I wouldn't, I didn't even write a lick of word or drew or did anything, like anything artistic at all. I think I was just programmed to be a wife, uh, a daughter and a, and a mother. And I think that was it. I think when you realize that you need to break out of that mold to kind of find yourself, I think uh, I found myself trying to find avenues to express myself, you know? Um, so I, I just saw something on TikTok and then they were like, you know, well, you could make extra income. And I'm going like, all right, so I'm a single mom. 
uh, there would be nothing wrong with supplementing my income. And if it's like, you know, just extra money, why not? So the misconception that I came in with really, although it's a good misconception, is that, you know, I came in, but then, you know, you you really quickly figure out that it's like the same thing everywhere, right? You have to work really hard at what you do. So, and um, that's given, right? When you, if even if I was to take a part-time job, I would have had to work, right? Uh, similarly, you know, I'd ha- I came in thinking that I'm just going to, there's like bags of money lying around in Web3 and I was just going to collect them, but that just didn't work out that way. But luckily there were some really good people um, that I spoke to that I met on spaces that kind of changed my idea of like, you know, what the space can do. And really quickly being a mom of two, it made me realize that this is the next thing. Like this is where I need to be to align my kids to, you know, for their future. Because, you know, they can go to the regular run-of-the-mill schools, colleges, and that's good. That's traditional, you know, foundation that you need to lay. But they still need to be, um, you know, brought up with the new skill sets that are required for the new world. And if I'm going to be in this position now, I may be able to guide them a little bit better. So I think that was the reason why I got in. And I stayed because it's not a question of just my kids. I think it became a question of all those kids who come from like, you know, uh, underprivileged or, you know, lower, you know, underprivileged, you know, countries, developing countries, uh, underdeveloped countries, and, you know, lower income, a cause then. It becomes like, well, if I'm doing this for my kids, shouldn't I be able to do it equal, I mean, equally, uh, fairly easily if I was to, you know, set up myself to be able to do that for other kids? So my project basically, even though in the beginning, just like any startup, would need uh, funding to be able to stand on its own two feet, but the ultimate vision really is to be able to set up uh, youth centers in the metaverse. So that way we're able to train these kids or train the youth that are going to high school or coming out of high, like they're going to come out of high school in the next year or so to be able to say, well, you know, jump on board, learn the skill set that you're good at, whether it be gaming, coding, uh, animation, whatever it is that you need uh, to be able to create that platform and that safe space for them so they can come train, understand the business and then be able to maneuver it themselves. This gives everybody an opportunity to pull themselves out of poverty. Like you're not dependent on somebody, some corporate person in IRL trying to pick you up. It's more like you rewrite your own destiny and it gives you that space. And the good thing about this space is a lot of people have the same mindset. They want to do this for the community because most of us are middle class, lower middle class trying to come into, you know, getting uh, additional supplemental income. So we're, we're kind of aware that there's a need for others to be able to, you know, for us to be able to pick others up. So I think that that's the reason why I feel Web3 is a good place for everybody to be, to be able to empower and onboard people. I hope that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. I, 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 but, but you, you know, um, whenever you're ready, like I could, I'll introduce you to some other people when it comes to VR and all, you know, at the metaverse and stuff, because, you know, when it comes to kids going into uh, the metaverse, there's a lot of controversy about that too. Like they have to, their parents have to be part of this. So, um, and what you know, do you think about that? You're absolutely right about that. Because again, internet, again, think about it this way, TikTok, right? Any child can access it, right? Are there any regulations around it? No, not at the moment. Yeah, I mean, the, the parents or guardians are expected to watch over, but does that happen now? So, I mean, we're all so new to Web3. I'm sure that there's going to be a lot of, I don't want to say regulations because Web3, I ideally means decentralization, right? But there has to be some controlled chaos. I think that, you know, that there has to be some sort of rules or, you know, foundations or some boundaries set so that, you know, we can, they can navigate the space safely or the entities that are actually creating that safe space need to have some regulations or boundaries in place so that they can do that. Uh, you know, I feel it's, um, it's possible and um, I agree, but at the same time, I think if the parents see the benefit of, you know, um, Web3, they'll probably be on board. I mean, they should be active. I mean, every parent should be concerned about what their kids are doing, what they're watching, you know, who they're listening to. It's it's a good thing to be, you know, on top of that. So I would be on board for it. I'm a parent, so I know exactly how that goes. I, so I'm also a parent with some little ones. Well, and one of them is 13. So certainly now on all of these social platforms and um, they're learning in school now about Web3 as well in their tech classes and such, which I, I find pretty fascinating 
because I think it's super, you know, I, I don't know if it's just simply in their school or if other schools are starting to integrate the same thing, but I am happy that it's a conversation that they're having, that they are helping them to jump into it um, because I, I do think it's so important. And as a parent, I'm not as um, ready to, let's say, train the new generation on what to do because we're still learning. So um, I do, you know, I think everything that you were just saying, though, really rings very true on on the importance of this. And I think it's incredible what you're doing in the space. Um, I I haven't heard about a lot of other people thinking about like youth centers and things like that. And I just, and that's amazing. So um, just to put things into perspective, I've actually met eight-year-olds and nine and 10-year-olds who, who have their own projects. And I am absolutely blown away by the fact that they're doing these NFT projects to fund a cause. I mean, um, they develop these programs, they develop these, um, you know, NFTs, which is amazing to me. And I'm going like, wow, I mean, I'm a 41 year old in this space and I'm trying to navigate this. I mean, these kids are like eons ahead of me because they're already thinking about saving and preserving the earth. They're already thinking about being the leaders, you know, the next generation leaders. And I think that it's important that as long as the parent is involved and understands the needs of the child, it's easily, nav it can be easily navigated. Because uh, I usually, like when my kids and I sold um, two of my, well, my daughter did a painting, an oil painting, my seven-year-old. I was able to, I put it up on, um, the, I mean, I put it up on OpenSea for sale. And she, we minted like 20 pieces of it. Three are already sold. Like three people bought it. Uh, and then there's like another cartoon character that she made. And this is just to, um, how should I say, great, you know, kind of like raise her confidence. Like I want her to feel that she fits into this space. But. As long as I am overseeing that, I think I'm okay with it. But at some point in time, you know, when they're ready for it, uh, as a parent, you're just going to have to let go. And hopefully cross your fingers and <laughs> whether it be in real life or something, you're just going to have to cross your fingers and hope you train them really well. And you're in the background just watching and waiting for them to, you know, call for help if they need. And that's how I would like, to, you know, that's how I'm going to train my kids. Um, I mean, it's not necessary that every parent sees it that way. But that's how um, I feel would be the most um it's, it's not like a Band-Aid, like, you know, where you can rip it off and it kind of hurts a lot. It's like a big ouch, but it's going to be more like a smaller, kind of like your cloth band where you unwrap it. You're still there and you're like, okay, if something goes wrong, I'm here. Just, you know, let me know and I'll come and see what I can do kind of thing. So um, that that's my take on parenting and Web3. But what a great way to connect with your child, though, you know? It absolutely is, because I'll tell you how she came about that painting that she sold. So these kids are so good at technology. Like, she loves Procreate on iPad, and she just went all crazy with, like, you know, cartoons and flowers and designing dresses because she wants to be a fashion designer. And she comes to me, and she's like, Mom, I'm an artist. Like, I told her, like, you know, well, she says, I, I want to I grow up to be a fashion designer because I'm an artist. And I said, okay. And I said, like, cool. I said, like, do you, do you, I mean, do you want, do you know how to use your watercolors? I mean, how about you create something for me with that? She's like, oh, well, I have Procreate. Why do I need to do that? So I was like, all right, let's test your wits, right? So I ordered like a whole bunch of acrylic paints and oil paints and, and a bunch of canvases. So one day we just sat down that afternoon, the three of us, and we're like, let's paint. And so that's all is all we did. She got so frustrated because she actually thought that the brush was supposed to mix the paint for her. Like she was that upset because Procreate can do that. She was thinking like, why isn't this brush mixing the color correctly? And then I'm like, baby, you got to do that. It's not going to do for you. You got to figure out how much you need to take. She's like, well, this is crazy. Like, you know, my, my iPad does it easily. I'm like, yeah, that's because everything's laid out for you and you just select. But in real life, I mean, you're going to have to choose it. And she got mad and she put all brown and black. And then she just sat there in a corner, like moping about it. And I'm like, oh, man, if I don't handle this right now, it's going to last the whole day. So I just went up to her. I was like, what's wrong? And she's like, look, it's all black and brown. She's like, I don't like it. You and, you know, Dahlia's paintings are really nice. And I, I, I don't like this. And I said, like, well, I mean, look at it. It's like the perfect canvas for you to drop anything on it. And it's just going to pop. Because it's brown and black. It's neither brown nor black. And it's just going to be the perfect canvas for you to do something. And she goes, is it? And I'm like, yeah, look at it. I mean, it's, it's all one shade. It's perfect. It's the dark background. You put anything color on it, it's just going to pop. What do you want to do? And she goes, well, I want flowers like yours. And I want the moon like my, my sister's. And I said, okay, fine. Let's do this. And I 
drew like a, I put a couple of blobs of, you know, uh, color uh, like yellows and pinks. And I showed her how to do a couple of those. And then she went on about it by herself. I just drew the moon for her and she was good and she was happy and satisfied with her project. And then every weekend that she's like kind of bored and she doesn't want to do procreate anymore, she just reaches for the paints. And I love that. I mean, I, I want her to practice so that way she gets better at it. And it's a skill set. I think we're not teaching our kids basic skill sets, although we have like technology that could do things at lightning speed. I still think uh, I give a lot of respect. I think that I respect traditional artists because it takes a lifetime of learning to even like have a brush stroke go a certain way. You know what I'm saying? Um, I see a lot of Zen art. And if you've noticed the Zen art, like the person who uses those brushes has to be skillful as though I, almost it looks as though like it's so easy, right? To handle those brushes. It's not. There's a specific stroke. There's a specific movement they have to master to be able to do those paintings in just a couple of minutes. And uh, I think that's what I want my kids to learn. Being an artist, it's about being multidisciplinary. You don't have to just stick to procreate. You can still, you know, do your own oil paints, acrylics, abstracts, whatever it is that your heart pleases, you can do that. And that was the whole purpose of me teaching her how to do that painting part of it. So she understands. That's great. And you guys got, you connected some, oh my gosh, that's like, like my child is much bigger. Than, he's a full grown man now, but um, I just think about like, I remember all the painting school and all the classes, the museums that I the art schools that he went through. And I still actually have a lot, a lot of his pictures. I'm going to put it as an NFT so that for myself to look at. But um, now with that in mind, like, are you, do you feel getting into Web3 has, has it like brought your kids to you closer, made that connection for you? And uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's debatable because I'm so into it. And I think that my cause is so uh, clear in like my purpose because I've realized that this is what I want to do. And this could change so many things and so many people's lives. I feel uh, that I'm able to impact. And, I, you know, I am, I'm hoping to impact also because it gives you not only uh, for, you know, people to come into this space and make some money, but also build some really good relationships, some really good business connections. Like what LinkedIn is for, you know, nine to five people, like uh, people in the corporate world, Twitter has become that for, you know, professionals who are building empires and businesses, which is amazing to me. So I feel that I'm a lot on these spaces. I'm co-hosting, hosting, talking in mental health spaces, talking in other spaces, just trying to get to know the community. So that way I'm able to understand what the needs are. And sometimes it could be a challenge, although my kids know that this is my purpose and I've already talked to them, that I really love doing what I do here. And it really uh, makes me feel happy when I wake up in the morning. I'm not tired. Um, I feel like I'm living my cause. And, you know, uh, they understand that. But they would prefer me being with them more. So... <laughs> No, that's understandable. I mean, like, I'm sure you sit in William's space, who is like, I'm going to be his guest tomorrow. He's from Thailand. He's like, he's like 14 years old. He has his own space show. Uh, he's doing this whole, like, um, Women History Month. So he's bringing all these different women up and talking about his 14 years. And I had uh, Malena. She's like 10-year-old NFT artist. She hosts her own spaces. And, you know, her parents are, are the, her mom is a, uh, a nurse practitioner, but so her dad, but they each, they both have a NFT project. It was, it was interesting. And then their daughter, she doesn't get it. She's not allowed to go on Twitter anytime she wants. It's more of like when they're there, then they go on and she's in, and she has it planned out. She does her own space with all these kids in there. So that's an interesting time we're living in where children are jumping on space, talking about art and their NFT project and, and ask, you know, like, like so they are more professional sounding than I am as far as you know hey you know let's ask some questions and they, they're like very organized so with that in mind do you think your daughter would get involved in something like that with their projects oh my seven-year-old would probably jump in like in a, heart, in a heartbeat <laughs> but I think that um I want her to kind of take her time uh, understand what she wants to do because kids are like you know I mean they're in the sense that they have their fickle minds right I don't want them to feel the pressure of it yet uh, I tell both of my kids that I say, figure out what you want to do for the rest of, not right now, but you know, figure out what you want to do because it's going to change over time. Like today you want to be a fashion designer. Tomorrow you want to be a princess. Like the after tomorrow you want to be a scientist. It's going to change. I don't want to hold you guys to a certain thing and then expect, and because the thing is as parents will expect them to see it. through, And it's a kid's nature to not do it. And that's okay. 
So I don't want her to ever feel the pressure because when, when her paintings sell, I tell her, she just has this smile. Oh, who bought it? And I show her who bought it. And she was, and I just kind of post the post and I show her this person bought it. And I was like, oh, they liked my painting. I said, yep. And there's no pressure. Like there's no pressure for her. She wants to do it at her convenience. She doesn't want to do it. That's her choice. She wants to actually come on and have a YouTube channel, which I'm like, well, here's the thing. Mom's kind of doing other stuff. I'm going to have to oversee you doing that. So uh, we'll figure that out at some point in time. But, you know, she definitely wants to have a YouTube channel. I think, Emily, isn't that a thing for all the kids nowadays is to have a YouTube channel? Or is it TikTok? Well, so it depends on the age because the older ones have a TikTok. But my little one, I don't like go on TikTok. And I think a lot of the parents are trying our hardest to keep them off TikTok as long as possible right now, given some of the content. Um, but YouTube, they all seem to have YouTube channels now. And a lot of them, you know, they'll they'll video game or they'll play with, you know, toys or something and run things in the background and have reaction videos or talk about things. And it's adorable. Um, and I will say the one nice thing about YouTube, if this helps at all for you, Sia, is you can bulk content in one day with them and just film a lot of videos. And um, that way it doesn't have to be like, we definitely don't put weeks or days of time into it. We do like one filming day and he can film all the things that he wants in that one day. Because otherwise, yeah, I'm like, mom's got other things I need to do right now. Yeah, I think she's very like, you know, um, little girls, like seven-year-olds, they, they change their mind at the drop of the hat. <laughs> And I'm going like, you know, when you're absolutely certain you want to do something, let's video, <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> Apologize, my throat just was acting up, but. Ah, no uh, worries. Yeah, so I mean, you know, she, 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 like a minute ago, like in a minute, she'll be like, oh, I want to do this. And then the next minute she wants to do something else. So I've, uh, what I've done is I've distanced myself from their artistic nature. Because I'm different. I, per I perform at a different level when I'm doing something. Uh, and me expecting that on my kids would be unreasonable because they're, in, you know, they're individuals. They're human beings. They, they have a different way of seeing things. So I let them be them. What I do is I do video record her little musicals and her dances or if she has a uh, her ukulele and she's playing something. I record them and we, look, we watch them as a family. But, you know, as far as like YouTube, I think that I don't want her to have um, post some videos and then she doesn't post for a while and then she has some backlash. And sometimes it's your own people, like your own relatives will be like, oh, well, I guess she's not doing that anymore, you know, and uh, I, I don't want people tracking what she's doing and not doing. I'd rather keep her in the safe zone of me where I can see as a parent what she's doing and not doing. And that's okay because I don't judge. But then when they, when we kind of expose them to that public eye, uh, they're vulnerable, you know, like people will say some mean stuff. They'll say some stuff and I don't want that to impact them. I want them to have the emotional and the mental strength uh, and understand that this happens. And I've talked about my own videos and then some people commenting stuff and I talk to them about it and how it makes me feel. And then how I overcome it. So that way, you know, uh, when they're ready to take that step of coming in front of the public or in the public eye, they know at least, if not 100%, maybe 30%, right, how to handle that situation. And the rest of the way, I'm there to help them. But that was my take on, like, not doing YouTube videos yet for her because I really want her to be certain that she wants to do it. We can set a schedule to it, and then we want to do it. And if it becomes repetitive, nine out of ten times, kids try to, like, escape it because they don't like that kind of routine because they want their time to be free. They want to do whatever they want. They want to watch TV. So I've noticed that with her, so I've let her be. I'm like, you tell me when you're ready for it, and we'll do it. Like, even with my older daughter, too. Uh, she's an autodidact. She likes to, you know, she listens to, she teaches herself instruments. She loves to do that. So uh, when she's playing or something, I'll record her just because I'm a proud mama. I'll just record her and keep it, but I won't necessarily share it. But her pictures or photography, she likes photography also. Those are the things that, you know, small things I don't tell them, but I post them as NFTs or I post them on my TikTok or YouTube. Well, not YouTube, sorry, but Instagram. And then, you know, people like it. I just show them like, hey, uh, these many people liked your stuff. And I just, you know, keep it at that. And that's it. No pressure. So are you like the cool mom or something? <laughs> like, no, no, no mom. And, cool. and, and not too many parents. I mean, like parents are into the tech savvy, but the ones that I know, they're not really as tech savvy as their own kids. No, I, I'm in the IT field. I'm not as tech savvy, but, you know, uh, I think they're still better than me. But, uh, yeah, I'm, by, I'm, I'm nowhere near being a cool mom. I think that, you know, uh, being a single parent kind of puts an extra burden sometimes on you to 
kind of live both aspects of it, the disciplinarian and then the the, the spoiler. So I, I kind of find myself sometimes in that challenge where I'm like, what do I do next? But uh, what I have learned is that, you know, just like I need time to uh, heal from all the other stuff that has happened. I think they have been through the same ride with me. So I feel like I just want to give them a break. Like I want them to just not have expectations as long as they're with me because the world's going to burden them with a lot of expectations once they get out. So I feel like, you know, giving them that safe space is my biggest and the foremost priority right now. I love that. So um, let me go ahead and uh, we, we had a couple of people wanted to grab the mic, but um, we were in the middle of our conversation. But now it's 1030. I want to go ahead and put the mic out. We have some people here. But you know what they say that when you go through struggle, you always you get an enlightenment. You know, you either have an entitled or you enlighten. So um your struggle, it feels like you have been enlightened and you, you know, and it's, it's passing on to your daughters. That's so important because we want to be the best example for our children. Hi Musky. I just gave you the mic. How are you? Did you have a question? Did I pronounce it right? <laughs> Oh, oh, wait then. Um, so, so you, when you when you host spaces, how, how do you feel about social audio? I feel like social audio is just a huge game changer. I mean, I've been in your spaces where you have like two people, but then you have like hundreds of people. Um, tell us about that, being able to go into a space and, you know, what was it like? And also, um, you know, what is it like to, to host a space? And especially when it comes to men mental health, that's, that's, a, that's a huge subject matter. And I'm highly addicted to Twitter spaces, so. Let's talk about that. So, um, yeah. So I think uh, early on when I started, I think, and I, when I was telling you, I had this huge misconception that Web3 has bags of money lying out and we're supposed to go collect them. Uh, I, you know, minted a couple of pieces and I jumped on thinking, thinking, well, why are my pieces not selling? It dawned on me that I need to market it, right? So um, <laughs> I, I heard a couple of people saying, I'm on spaces. That's how you will know. You'll know the community. So I jumped into spaces and I think around about five weeks after I was about to give up and I ended up in a space where these two like really amazing people uh, were hosting and they kind of uh, took me in uh, after hearing, you know, my story and my version of like why I'm here. Uh, they just pulled me up and threw me to the sharks and they gave me the co-hosting thing. So they asked me to co-host with them. I was like, Oh my God. And then um, it started that way. I was very nervous, but soon I realized that, you know, once you get a voice, uh, and that's what co-hosting and hosting did for me. It gives you a voice. Uh, it it kind of puts things into perspective for you as to like what you're doing, what is your mission, what are you here to do? You can't BS about it. it it's very, for me, it's very personal because when I'm co-hosting, hosting or speaking, it becomes like, you know, where I want to deliver my message as to what I'm doing in this space as clearly and concisely as possible. Uh, because to me, this is a like this is a game changer. This space is. So when I have hundreds of people and we have mental health spaces, most of my spaces are called happy hour because every Wednesday I have it from six to nine. The reason why I have it that way is because I want people to come in with no pressure at all because I don't want them to worry about shilling, which is like you're talking about your project. I don't want to think that I don't want them to think it's about mental health. So they, they have a pressure of talking about their mental health. I just say it's happy hour. It's like, you know, how you would end up at a bar and you're sitting with somebody and you just have a good conversation. And you leave happy. So it's like right before you go home, you hit your favorite bar, you sit there for a couple of minutes and you talk to people. So I think I act as a bartender, really. I sit there and I listen. Um, I tell them that you know, if you want to talk about your project, you want us to review it, we can do that. You want to talk about your boss, you hate them, uh, you hate their guts, we're here to listen. <laughs> uh, as far as mental health goes, we talk about it, but I do have a disclaimer. I am not a licensed therapist, so I usually, what I tend to do is I actually got some really good resource about helplines all across the world. Uh, it's a post that one of, uh, one of the gentlemen in one of the spaces posted, which I absolutely thought was such a great resource. So I do have a disclaimer. I post that up in like a pin tweet on the top of the carousel. So I just let them know that if they feel that they need to speak to somebody and they don't know who to, then there's helplines all across the world in that particular pin tweet, they can reach out to anybody there. But because we're not licensed therapists, we can listen, but we may not be able to advise. We can just, you know, sympathize and, uh, you know, help them in that way and then direct them to maybe a therapist or somebody else. But um, I, I usually put that in because a lot of times what happens is, although we want to help the, a, a person in front of us, you have to realize that you don't have the capacity to assist them 
navigate those emotional feelings because we're not trained to do that. And, you know, I usually just talk about any experiences that I have uh, as to like how I cope with stress, anxiety and the practices that I use. But I never advise on like this is the method or this is what you need to do, you know. But so that has helped me so far. People have connected with me because I feel I don't I, they're not obligated to share anything with me if they don't want to. But at the same time, uh, I want them to be free when they're in my spaces and talk about who they are. and You know, what are they doing here? That's it. I mean, no pressure. I think that's how I operate. Like, you know, people want to come talk to me. Perfect. Um, you know, if people want to connect with me, that's great. And, you know, I reciprocate that love because I feel like when people give you love, you reciprocate that. Uh, but there's no pressure in most of my spaces. Anytime I'm speaking in spaces and if I find spaces that are, uh, you know, very stringent on mental health and they talk um on and like you know, they they go unlimited on mental health. I usually advise those hosts and co-hosts also to kind of take a break, because it's a lot of energy that you're absorbing from other people because you're listening, absorbing, and then you're validating or responding. That takes a lot of energy, and you need to be able to protect yourself. So um, yeah, that's pretty much what I do. Yeah, I, I feel like spaces, is, it could be like, well, I did feel like I was at a bar when I went to your space. I mean, <laughs> people were just talking about different things and sharing. I mean, like, if you know, you sit at the bar and you, drink, and you have a drink. I don't drink anymore, but I'm just saying, like, you know, when you sit at the bar, you go to the same bar, you talk to the same people, you share about what's going on. It's just like, you know, when I used to take the tri-rail um, to go to work in Boca, when I lived up in Palm Beach, I would, you know talk to the same people. It, it was a nice way to unwind before the day starts. And there's also an, a great way to unwind when the day ends. So that's how I feel like when I was in your space, like I was stopping by and saying hi to everybody. Yeah, I mean, there's people who come in, they they just want to, a lot of times uh, Twitter spaces has you believe that you need to show your project every time because you want more eyes on your project. But I feel I completely go against that because I I've, I think I've been a rebel all my life. I think I go against the grain. So uh, for me, it's always been, you know, just relax. You know, people who are meant to align with you will align with you. I talk about my project in terms of like, you know, just as I would discuss it with my friends or somebody who's like my advisor, right? This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm thinking about, you know, and if they have any ideas or they have any connections and a lot of connections have been made in my spaces, we actually drop a lot of alpha unknowingly because we're discussing stuff at such authentic level where you're like just talking about a project and you go so deep into it. You're like, well, I saw this video and that helped me do this. I wrote a smart contract doing this. Um, I know this person who's doing the same project as you. Let me connect you to them. Like those are the things that come out of those conversations. I really love smaller rooms because of that, because you're able to connect with people one on one and you can cycle the room faster and, you know, more efficiently because you can get everybody a turn to speak. So I just actually made, um, speaking of giving everybody a turn to speak, I saw that there was a request from the Boss Girls. So I wanted to um, turn the mic over to you if you wanted to say something as well. Thank you. And the Boss Girls are first Empower Yourself Monday episode. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Virginia. Hey. I had a question, actually. So the host of the space is AWC South Florida. I'm one of the founders. I'm actually in the Tampa Bay. I was curious if that foundation was coming into the web3 space because i've been trying to connect with other foundations well oh, i so i'm the president emily is the communication director and terry is the vp our national chapter have not gotten into web3 yet they are looking to me um because i've been talking about it i actually have brought out the whole program and everything so yes and there is someone in tampa that is a member of women in communication and I'm trying to help them get start the West Coast women because we're on the we're on the East Coast, so we have Palm Beach County, Broward, and Miami Dade. You're on the West Coast, which has like Tampa, Lake. I mean, there's a lot going on in, in the West Coast. So yeah, we're trying to get. I mean, yeah, I'm. We should talk offline because I'm trying to like get 
um, of a West Coast Florida uh, presence. And you know, we were willing to like. I'm, I'm gonna. We're gonna talk offline because I, I have someone over already over there that she's trying to start a chapter over there. Oh, that's awesome! I'd love to connect in DMs. I was just curious because um, we want to give away scholarships and stuff, and I've been wanting to connect with more Florida foundations. So that's awesome! Thank you so much for that inf information. Yeah, and um, if you need help, like I can give you a list of information about scholarship. Because we, uh, we went through this with um, Florida Atlantic University, FAU, and um, what they want and stuff. But then if you want to just do your own, I think sometimes it's better because when you go through the university, like we, what we were trying to do, um, you don't really get have control of it. It's, it's prestige to have the university behind you. But, you know, we women in communication start. We were we started out in 1909 at, at University of Washington. So we have the student chapter. Um, but we just don't have much in South Florida. We used to have FIU. But the uh, professor that was part of it, she just, she's wrote, she's written during this whole time, she's written like 15 books already. So she's kind of, I think she's retired now. <laughs> she's, she's like, I've written so much books about communication, Web 2. And I, I haven't heard anything from her as far as Web 3. But that's the direction we're get bringing our, you know, for 2022, our goal is to raise more awareness about Web 3 and bring more communicators to our area into it. So I hope that answered your question. Yeah, it was perfect. Thank you so much. I love I love the um, all the different uh, women's project, the empowerment project that's happening. Don't you, Emily? Because down here we have a lot of different women's group too. Um, but I love seeing this in a digital world. I do too. I feel like all of you know. Web3 has the potential to be very male dominated. And yet I'm seeing that a lot of women are also, again, you know, seeing that in the digital space, it usually is very male dominated, patriarchal, so forth. So there's there's women who are really pushing to become a large part of this space and to get more women out there and, you know, bring more, get more women involved. And the more that the more one woman or two women or three women, the more that we all get involved and open up the space to other women and support other women coming into Web3, the more we'll be able to take over Web3. No, I'm just not taking over. Just be equal spaces, you know, in an equal space as the men in Web3 and be able to provide resources and support and be inclusive for everybody in the space. And it's it's an exciting time. So I'm happy to see it. And we do have a lot of like really phenomenal women's projects that we've been seeing on um, all of our empowerment episodes and talking to some great women and seeing women in these spaces who keep popping up. Yeah, I, um, it's, a, it's an exciting time. I actually was talking about swags, Emily. <laughs> NFT swags. <laughs> okay, since we're all here and we have about 15 minutes left, um, what are your thoughts about having an event, like a Web3 event, but instead of having actual products you know like people get and stuff like why not have like a swag bag but with nfts in it and that would be part of you know when you go to a an event it could be in a metaverse too but most people don't have goggles but it could do an xr where you can just go in as an avatar or you could just just go do the same by itself but instead of having different items um uh oh <laughs> emily got kicked out she's coming back so when, when uh so I don't know, like if you went to a, a, an event and all they gave was like, because the swag was all NFT, would you be excited or would everybody think it's weird? I think it would be cool. I think it would be the new way of thinking about how to, you know, invest. So, I mean, if the swag bag had a couple of NFTs, the price could and the floor price could increase. So definitely it would be a great investment. I mean, if you were to give them a perfume or a makeup or a bag or something, I mean, it would depreciate. So this would appreciate in value. So why not? Or that they, if like, for, for example, we had uh, Margarita, I just killed her last name, Arigada. It's, 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 she has like a, a lipstick line, a beauté, uh, Valde Beauté is her company. And I freaking love her. And, and she has had me thinking, because, you know, when I do events, I'm all about the swag. I... I go out of my way to make sure my swags is like, like when people walk out of my event, that swag is what they think of. But then I was talking to her and I was like, well, you know, when it comes to beauty, I always think of fashion. I think of different things going on. Um, 
Oh, she can't get back in. Um, let me uh, invite Emily back in again. Let's see. Uh, so, you know, like, so and so you can give someone an NFT to say, take this back to my counter and they'll give you a, uh, like, a, like a, a lipstick or, you know, eyeshadow, whatever that is based on what you're looking to do. And, and I just think that's so much better, cheaper in the environment and um, being able to have people you know, experience your, your services or your project or your item, because, you know, you can, instead of you carrying all this stuff, it's all in digital. It's so that you can just go and, and redeem it or show it. Cause a lot of people are doing tokens and NFT so that you can like, I feel like cosmetic company, you know, my background is luxury sales. So I used to like have, um, a lot of different events based on my makeup and stuff. So I mean, I would, people, they, they call it bounce back cards. You know, when you give people bounce back cards and they come back in, they come to the store with a bounce back card, they get either a free foundation or free some or a free lipstick or a free bronzer or something like that. But what if you were able to give an NFT and that NFT is, you can resell it if you want, but if a company was able to do that, they, you can go to any counter in the world and show this NFT. And that gives you the ability to, to try out the, 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 the latest foundation that they came out with or to sample the latest lipstick. I don't know, something to think about. Saya, what are your thoughts? Yeah, uh, to Tanya, actually, that's a great idea. That would be the unlockable content part of the NFT. So what you would do is like if you were to tie a product or a service with it, it becomes an unlockable content. So the NFT would have uh, its value, but then it would be added value if you give them a service or a product. So which means that the buyer, when they buy this NFT, has that unlockable content or that barcode or that coupon to get that free product, right? or get a free consult for makeup or whatever it is that you guys are planning on putting in. Uh, they can go that, but it has to be non-transferable, which means that, that once the product is used the first time, the value of that additional add-on value diminishes, which means that now if they sell it, they can only sell the NFT part of it, which means see, it's, a, it's a kind of like a double-edged sword, but you need to make sure that your NFT is worth something, and then you need to add on a value to it. So the add-on value will go away once the user uses it because it can be transferred. Um, but, you know, it could be where, you know, first generation holders or flippers, you could you could build it out in such a way that the person who inherits it from the first buyer could potentially get some benefits later on. Maybe they could get a white list spot, list spot or they could get discounts or, you know, additional perks at some point in time. Like it could all be designed. But then again, it's a project in itself. So you'd have to have a roadmap about it as to what would go into the first user versus the trails that come later on. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, we got that needs to be a class. <laughs> like, we need to talk about this. Well, because those are the, the educational component that we're developing and building. Because what we want to be able to do is bring our members and our followers into Web3, but not overwhelm them. So most of our followers are publicists, journalists, um, brand developer, you know, communication specialists. But most of the time, their job is to figure out how things are presented so marketing we have a lot of marketing we have a lot of real estate real estate people we have we have a lot of different type of uh communicators and different niches because so i can't just you know we originally started out as a journalist we made the first in 1909 we formed the first women ran student newspaper so for us back then women weren't even allowed to drive or vote yet so um so now for going forward that's where i look at this as such an uh an incredible time because I joined Women in Communication in 2008, where I was bringing in Web 2. We were just talking Web 2, Web 2. And now here I am in 2022, we're walking, talking about Web 3. So um, with that in mind, there's so much, like it's the same old stuff in Web 2, but better that has to be taught. So um, yeah, Definitely. if you want to do a class, we need to do a class. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. I mean, I wouldn't, uh, I would, I would love to, you know, um, you know, join, you know, collaborate with you if you ever need advice on anything. And if you guys are coming up with a product, um, I would love to be a part of that for sure. So, yeah, we can definitely have a conversation offline. And, you know, if you want to design something in terms of a NFT project for your giveaways, yeah, I'd be more than happy to jump on board. It has. It's about 10.53. Um, Emily can't get back on. I don't know what. I think she's having issues with Twitter. But um, I want to say hi to my friend Alton. He's here. He's in the space also. And hello, Shadow Pub. Oh, I need to find out more about 
this. And then we also have in the space, Joe. Hi, Joe. How's it going? And Chassie is here too. He's from South Florida also. Um, but um, I appreciate everyone for being here. So we have about seven minutes left. So did you want to share some like tips or must must do before you get into Web3? Yeah, absolutely. So for me, it was always like, you know, understanding one is, you know, when you're coming to NFT, you're like, what is an NFT? Have the basic understanding what NFT does, what are blockchains, you know, where you want to be. Um, and what are you planning on doing here? Write it out. Because I think that that's the, that's the part that I missed. Because when you get into the hype of the videos and you try to jump in, uh, you want to do stuff and you kind of miss steps in, this, in, in, in the process. So uh, my suggestion would be to first understand what NFTs are. Go on to YouTube. YouTube has some amazing uh, resources where you can understand what NFTs are, what do they do. Uh, research Board API Club because that would be the first, your, your use case really to understand what uh, you know, uh, what this space can do for you, like doodles, um, you know, ta you know, you can also research beeples. Like there's so many other brands that are in this space that have succeeded. Those are your use cases to learn from, whether you want to be a one-on-one -on -one artist, you want to do generative art, that's all up to you. But the thing is you need to lay the foundation down, which is understanding what NFT is, what it does, what do you want it to do for you? And how do you want to use that NFT to give back to the community. Once you have those four things ironed out, I think you'll have a clear perspective on what you need to do. And then you can jump into Twitter spaces, jump in spaces and listen to people talking about NFTs, pitching their projects, understand how to do the basics of pitching a project. But before you do all of that, YouTube videos are the best place to start. Understand what an NFT is first. Uh, understand if you have art, what type of art category does it fall in? And what do you plan to do in this space? I think understanding those two or three concepts will give you headway in the spaces because a lot of people jump into space thinking that they can just really quickly mint a product and flip it. It doesn't work that way. You really need to do the research to get into it. Yeah, I learned that there's, there's people out here flipping NFT. That's, like, that's actually a thing. Yes, it is actually. One of my pieces got bought this morning. It's called uh, The Protector. It's about my interpretation of, uh, you know, Archangel Michael. And I had sold it for, I had listed for 0.066 and somebody bought it and listed it for 0.15. So, <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's, it's almost like a, a third more than what I had listed it for. So, um, you know, uh, it, uh, it does happen and it's a good space. That's how you make money. So. Oh, that's that's good. Well, I you know I didn't know about that. I feel like the the early days of the stock exchange. <laughs> yes, it is. It's the gold rush of the of the century, I suppose. And I'm waiting for somebody to run through spaces with a ticker with a piece of paper with all the, all the different NFTs. You that would know, be hilarious. You, you know the the stock exchange ticker tag. Yes, <laughs> yes. Writing so like we on need a to pizza. do that for like I think I should make that just for for a funny thing. But we should do that so we list all the different and because I feel like OpenSea and, and Rarible how they list what's you know it's like a stock market like what each one items are going for. It's kind of crazy. It is, but then if you look at the so I think that you know when artists put that in or whoever the artist is, they they have a specific uh, I want to say design or solution because NFTs solve a problem in the web space, web three space, right? So when your NFT solves a problem or fills a need, it becomes a necessity. So that's how I see NFTs. Like if you are providing, like mine are one-on-one -on -one arts, right? So people who are collectors will look at it going like, well, I want to keep it with me. Like I want to collect it and keep it. Uh, but then there's other stuff like generative projects that have specific, uh, you know, uh, in the, in the roadmap, they have certain milestones they have to reach. They have to do certain things. Uh, they actually you know, spell it out in their roadmap that this is what we need to do. And this is how we're going to give back to the community. So there's a lot of different things you learn in the Web3 space. And again, baby steps. Uh, don't jump in. Read a lot. Research a lot. You know, come into spaces. Uh, talk if you want to after listening for a bit and explain what you're trying to do. There's some really good people who will help you, who will guide you in terms of like what their story is like, and they'll be able to help you figure out your own. Uh, but then again, you need to be able to understand that like any other job, 
you're going to have to put in the time. It's all about consistency in Web3. You come here, you show up, you talk, you represent yourself and your business because you are a business. You're an entity that's coming into this space. As I mentioned, LinkedIn is for corporate people. Twitter is for business professionals. Very simple. So you are a business entity and you got to perform as such. That's so true. I love that. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, we have to collaborate. And um, the boss girl, yeah, we kind of have to collaborate because um, we're trying to create a, uh, for our women in communication, um, we're trying to create a, uh, like an education online for all the different um, women in communication, different members, because this it's not just our South Florida chapter. We've been, like I said, we've been around since 1909. We have chapters in every state. So everybody, every state has their different ways of how they communicate what their important, what their importance are. So um, from, for South Florida, we're highly into tech and social media. Hey, Bob. I'm going to say hi to my friend Bob. He's here too. And Amy. Hi, Amy. So uh, with that, um, Web3 is what we're um, focusing more on anything else. So um, National just got like November of last year. I, I was in charge of teaching Twitter spaces to um, the, for the National account. So we did that in November of last year. But everyone is still not, they think social audio is such a pretty thing in a box, you know, they're kind of like, oh, what should we do? And it's kind of like, I'm like, just turn on your, just go into Twitter and hit that Twitter space and turn it on and talk, talk about what you want to talk about and then use that as content because that's what we're doing. We're taking all the spaces, we cut it up in snippets. You're not going to see it all at once because it's, I tested already, uh, if I uh, publish every snippet in one spaces people get lost they get like tired so I'm, I'm cutting up snippets and i'm just sharing it out small snippets at a time and then and then having them come back to the website and read it so um and so today i uh, say so you are our you are a feature um communicator so your image and everything about you will be on our website all through the week until next monday um next monday we have a pharmacist um, she's a good friend of mine also, but she's also was one of our speakers for our Empower Yourself workshop. Her name is Kimmy Stoltz. She is a educator at um, University of no Nova University. She teaches uh, pharmacy and supplements. And then she has her own store and everything. She has a, like, a, it's called, it's like an Alexa drink, you know, because she's also healthy. So she'll be our guest next week. She'll tell us some really cool stuff. And so, yeah, thank you so much. Before I let you go, can you tell everyone how to get a hold of you? And again, what time is your space on Wednesday? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Tonya. I just wanted to say thank you for having me. I absolutely love this. And, you know, the more we uh, spread the word, you know, the, the, more, the better it'll be for the masses to be able to onboard and onboard the right way. Because, you know, you want to make sure that, you know, people who are coming in are safe. Uh, because, again, navigating any space, just like you wouldn't go to a country where, you know, anywhere and just book a ticket and fly out there and then get mugged, right? The same way, when you come into Web3, just think about it this way. It's a different country. You want to learn about it. You want to know what it is and then come in. So that's how I propose people to come into it. So but one way to get hold of me is I'm on Twitter. My handle is Sia underscore Sia underscore 99. Um, that's one way to get hold of me. And this is the best way to get hold of me because I'm pretty much in spaces constantly. I think I need to get rehab from Twitter, <laughs> but that's the best way to get hold of me. Um, and, you know, I do not have an, um, a specific Instagram or anything right now for my work uh, as a Web3 artist. But, you know, hopefully soon I'll get that done and LinkedIn as well. But for right now, this is the only way to get a hold of me at the moment. Perfect. Thank you, everybody. And again, my name is Tanya Schultz. Um, you can DM me if you need any help in Web3 or just a connection. And again, I'm not a uh, an artist. I've been in uh, Web3 since been studying NFT since February of last year. Um, I'm more of a communication specialist. So that's one of the reasons why we're bringing um, Web3 to Women Communication, the South Florida chapter, because we see this is the next wave of communication. And again, have a great day. We'll be back next Monday for Empower Yourself Monday at 10 a.m. And I'll be back at 12 today with my virtual film festival. Um, we're, uh, it's gonna be, it's at 12 p.m. So be back online again. Thank you so much. And I appreciate everyone for being here. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye, Tonya. Bye, take care.